Hello and welcome to another edition of The Business of Health. I am Giselle Wertheim Ames and of course we are hosted on the Nielsen Network. Today I'm going to be speaking to Robin Smith. She is the very passionate, um, visionary founder of Faithful to Nature. Faithful to Nature is Africa's leading website, e-commerce website selling natural products and was established around about 14 years ago by Robin in her late 20s, uh, very bright eyed, coming out of London uh, from a, a job where she was an innovation expert around strategy, consulting to leading multinationals. And she had this vision to provide to the South African market products that were non toxic and organic, and became a leader in a category that, which honestly at that time, was wide, wide open, and no one probably had even thought to do that because it was such a brave and emboldened step to enter a category which yeah, niche um, and 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 probably quite difficult and challenging. She's built this incredible business and quite recently sold out to investors who were very involved, and she's still a shareholder in the business, and she still you can see the the business very much her vision and her passion. And I've had the pleasure of being able to speak to, to Robin. And we are going to be talking about the lessons that she learned building um, Faithful to Nature over the last 14 years. So welcome, Robin. Thanks for um, inviting me. So I've always admired your website um, for a couple of reasons. I think, you know, it's what going on 14 years now. You were first in the market. And if I think back 14 years ago, wow, um, you're, you're a site that sells organic natural products. 14 years ago in South Africa, e-commerce online, you know, it's, it's, it, it was so wild, if you ask me. That was like really breakthrough stuff because e-commerce is still finding its way. We know that. There are massive players in the market. But 14 years ago, you had the foresight to get in. Um, and perhaps you can explain to us how that started, how... You know, what was that vision 14 years ago for Faithful to Nature? Sure, absolutely. So um, let's also remember that 14 years ago, I was 14 years younger and 14 years less experienced. And um, that naivety stood us in very good stead. But um, I had um, recently returned from London where I'd been working as an innovation consultant. And um, I was personally very passionate impassioned by using clean cosmetics. I was on this mission. Um, I'd, I'd, the penny had dropped with me personally that um, we absorb such a huge toxic load through our skin. Um, and I'd also become very impassioned by integrity of ingredient labeling because 14 years ago, there was very little integrity in ingredient labeling across products across the board. And so I returned to South Africa. Um, I quit my job in London um, because at that stage I knew that employment would never get any better. And so I, I knew that the next step had to be one of an entrepreneur. Um, and so I, I returned to South Africa not to show what I was going to do. And I set about um, just coincidentally finding some clean product to use for myself. And it was on this journey that I recognized that there was this massive gap in the market locally um, for the sale of ethical products, um, most notably natural and organic skincare at that time. Um, when I dug around and I went to markets, I saw that there actually was quite a develop, well-developed and exciting cottage industry happening on the ground of sort of mom and pop type enterprises of organic skincare and cleaning products. But the products were very poorly distributed. They were very poorly marketed, in fact, um, and packaged. Um, and it was very difficult to get hold of these products. And there was definitely um, a misnomer that developed in South Africa that should you want to be brave enough to try natural and organic skincare at that time, that you, would go, you were going to be rewarded with the dingiest, darkest part of the store. So there was nothing luxurious. You were not being rewarded at all for that discernment. And so this idea was birthed of changing all of that, of creating some kind of ethical shopping platform where ingredient integrity was one of our primary pillars, 
Um, I was really um, passionate about creating a luxurious shopping experience for those that wanted to use more natural products. And so that is how Fatal to Nature was born. Yeah. And it's so interesting that you kind of raised that issue because I'm getting my mind back to 14 years ago in terms of retail in South Africa, because we went, you know, the, the market developed from a lot of small little health shops and pharmacies who used to sell product. And then of course we saw the consolidation in the industry, these large retailers come in and start basically dominating the vitamin and the natural supplement and the demise started of the smaller, you know, more prolific health shops. They still exist obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they've, and they're still very unique in that way. But Honestly, um, I think that whole market just started shifting locally. Whereas compared to other markets overseas, we did see still some, you know, there's still dimension in, in, in the market. So I know when I used to go to the local health shop to find, it was very difficult to find cosmetics at all. In fact, I think they were imported cosmetics. So if you, so you're absolutely right. And they would obviously have to put the product that was more mainstream moving because they were also now competing with these large retailers. And again, interesting that um, you, you would came in at that time and the e-commerce market was just pretty much non-existent. So you mm-hmm. came when there was no one there. So, you know, one can't, you can understand that maybe we had to create like this bespoke, beautiful little shop and we could all visit to buy cosmetics, but you decided to go online. Because why? So, what did you um, did in 14 years ago? Well, um, I wish I could take credibility for my amazing vision, um, but it was act- truthfully, it was actually less of that and more of um, the premise that, you know, it's often through challenge and innovation that amazing, amazingness, awesomeness springs forward. Um, and the two challenges we faced at that time was the one that, w- one challenge we had was that we ha- I had very little starting capital. And I say we because my partner, my boyfriend at the time, um, helped me set up the shop. Um, And so we thought, it's it's actually not true, but we thought that we could only afford to create an online offering, um, that we wouldn't actually have the startup capital to create a physical shop. And the second reason, and um, probably the more important reason was that the market was so niche at that stage. Our customers were so dispersed across the country that we needed to be able to um, cater to every, each and every customer. We had to reach everyone because the market was so small. And the only way that we would reach everyone was through going online rather than just serving the physical community around us. And so you launched yourself into e-commerce in the early days of social media in the early, even in the early days of e-commerce, to be honest, um, to really, again, only, you know, the banks and I, you know, I worked at the bank at that time. So I remember look, surveying out what was happening and that was very visionary for whatever that reason was. I'm quite curious also how you set up your distribution because we didn't have the kind of what you have today. Now all these different companies offering cost efficient distribution of product out there. So how, how did you deal with that? Because that your cost of product was, was obviously also bespoke. And then on top of that, now you had to get it out. And probably to places, I would think that you were getting, you know, you were probably getting a lot of interest into small reaching places that didn't even, couldn't access probably a normal type of health shop, let alone a faithful to nature. Absolutely. So that's a very astute um, observation. We... So um, just to take a step back, um, in my career before um, founding Faithful to Nature, as I said, I was an innovation consultant. And the team that I worked in was a a team whereby we developed um, IP for um, cultural shifts. So many um, many big organizations were coming to our innovation firm every time they needed idea and eventually got to a point where they um, started to ask for us to help seed innovation culture so that they didn't have to keep coming back to us for ideas. And um, that gave me quite a unique perspective uh, in terms of setting up culture um, and cues in a business. And um, so, you know, many businesses only set about developing values over time, where with Faithful to Nature, we started with very well cemented values. And these values 
were based around the fact that we wanted to be a customer centric organization. And at that stage, I understood that um, I saw that the most valuable asset that we could ever grow was our customer cohort, which is the lifetime value of a customer. And I haven't forgotten about your question. It's, it's leading into that. Um, so, you know, we were faced with a choice because yes, career costs were um, not competitive and it was gonna be very difficult to get product to customers. So we um, tackled that challenge in two ways. The first way is in um, holding so dear to our hearts, this idea of being a customer centric organization and the lifetime value of a customer is that we, um, we eroded our profit significantly and took on a lot of the cost ourselves of couriering items to customers, which at that stage and truthfully for the next decade, not many businesses were prepared to do. So our customers were always very surprised by how cheap compared to the rest of the market it was to receive product, which meant that we had to create a lot more sale in order to actually create the profit that we needed to continue running the business. But it also meant that we had really seeded a huge um, voucher of loyalty between us and our customer. And the second thing that we did to overcome that challenge was that at that time, there was um, a lot of negativity towards the South African Postal Service. And we decided to give the Postal Service the benefit of the doubt. Um, we realized we had to use them. Um, and so we, we really, we had to develop all sorts of systems. My um, ex-business partner helped me set up the business, set up, he was a business anal analyst by training. And we set up systems to match our um, back end of our website to um, integrate a lot of the post, or the post offices tracking and systems into our system to make it very user friendly. So we kind of like help the post office become more user friendly to our customers. And I remember we'd, we'd been using the post office for about five years and we hadn't lost a single parcel. And at that stage, that was a major gripe that South Africans had was that parcels went missing. But because of the IP that we then developed around the tracking of parcels, we, we really held the post office's hand for our customers. So rather than just putting something into the post and going, well, you've paid for it. This is kind of where our relationship ends. I'm gonna take us back to why I spoke about the values. We, we, we actually managed the whole process for our customers. Um, and that's how we overcame those challenges. But it, it, very astute observation because it was possibly our biggest challenge at the time was our distribution. Yeah, and then of course now we look at the product and that, you know, you've, you've built such an incredible business and you would have done that by really being very careful about what you have put on your website over the years. And I'm sure you must have been tempted on many occasions to, or, or rather someone might have tried to tempt you to list products that perhaps were not aligned but would bring you in a lot of money. How have you set about really creating and then preserving the integrity of organic and, and this really this faithful to nature philosophy, this mission driven um, idea that you started with? So that all plays back into um, this very sincere desire to create a business um, that put its brand equity and therefore its, its cohort with its customers, that lifetime value as sort of a key pillar. And as a result, I um, always maintained, and it's something that I've shared with my staff over and over and over again, that we were not actually in the sale of natural and organic products that what we were indeed selling to our customers was transparency and honesty. Because as you will remember, you know, one of the things I was so impassioned by was product integrity um, and integrity in labeling. And um, you know, the, the very first message that we would always um, share with our customers was, you have a right to know what it is that you are in your, your products. And so essentially, um, by taking over that product, that, that process of vetting ingredients on behalf of our customers, we were doing the worrying for them. And um, it's because of that and the strength of that conviction and um, the strength of that pillar that we built our business around that it never made sense, even if it was generally tempting in the way that business is done to um, profiteer above that pillar because then we would not be we would no longer be selling transparency and 
honesty. And in terms of the way that we rewarded ourselves and we rewarded our staff, um, you know, the ways that our entire management system was set up in the business based around these values, we rewarded ourselves for honoring this, um, these values of caring and responsibility. Um, and so, yes, there were times where we had to debate what was the right thing to do. But in truth, um, it was never difficult because we always, we, we genuinely, I know this is perhaps difficult for many to, you know, you've had different experiences in retail and corporate, but it was never difficult to do the right thing. It was sometimes difficult to establish what the right thing was. So for instance, you know, we, we um, hair dye was a classic example. Um, truthfully, there's no such thing as natural permanent hair dye. Yeah. There, there isn't, but there are cleaner alternatives to that. And so, you know, we, we debated at length, do we sell hair dye? Because we have made a promise to our customers that we won't sell anything that's toxic. And this product is toxic, but there are alternatives that are less toxic. And so, for instance, what we did is we actually, no one asked us to do this. We then went and put on warnings um, into the product description that would then say to our customers, you know, you can buy this product, but please note it contains X, Y, and Z ingredient. And these could be the long-term consequences of that. Sure. So that really is uh, walking the talk all the way, way through. During yeah. this journey of yours, you must have had moments where you thought, oh my word, <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> How am I gonna get to tomorrow? You must have had some challenges, all entrepreneurs face those moments of, you know, whether it's funding crisis or, you know, making this major decision to go that way or this way. Um, and what was the one that perhaps frightened you the most or, the, or the, the decision that you had to take during that time of growth that was the most challenging for you personally? So um, we were plagued by cash flow issues for most of our adolescent um, life at Faithful to Nature. It took us about seven years to become mildly profitable, um, you know, which is, which is not that um, uh, unexpected with a, an e-commerce business model. It it's generally is a long tail business model, but um, I, you know, we didn't have much funding and, and, and the we to the eye is quite significant because my um, ex-business partner and ex-husband, who's still a good friend of mine, who helped me set up Faithful to Nature, it was his family that were kind of helping us fund the business to enable us to keep going, um, you know, through the lack of making a profit and, um, you know, keeping their business private. And um, when Christian and I parted ways and, you know, he was very clear that it was time to get on with his own career um, and I was left holding Faithful to Nature, which is what I wanted, I had no financial backing. And I had a 16 month old baby at the time freshly divorced, you know, I was still very young. I was 30 years old, didn't own my home, didn't own my car. It was terrifying. It, it really was. Um, and so I, I've, I, I've always been able to walk a very tight line in terms of risk and financial risk. Um, most entrepreneurs will identify this. I mean, you know, there were days where it was a case of buying food for the house or paying my staff and my staff would get paid and then I would order some product on top of that because I would rather that we had product than in the shop than product at home. But um, saying all of this, the most challenging decision for me personally was whether to take on investors or not. Because this business was so close to my heart and I poured so much of my own integrity and my own cosmology my own desire for how I wanted to see, you know, for, for the type of world that I wanted to live in. Um, I ran the business like, it was a family run business. Um, I, I, I really did live the values, um, so, you know, so there wasn't much separation between myself and my own persona and the business. And um, I dearly loved being an entrepreneur because when I say that I, I really had um, just, my bum in the butter with a job in London, you know, there was no reason for me to leave that. And it still wasn't enough. So this idea of bringing on investors and potentially having a boss um, 
creating for the first time conflict within the business between profit, you know, short term profit and long term customer value um, was a lot that I had to sit with. And um, yeah, I, you know, I, I eventually did take on investors and I believe that I made the right decision for the business. But I also knew when I took on investors that it was over time going to start signaling my own exit from the business. And that's is, so, is what happened. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's the, so the so interesting thing. So you create this incredible business and, and in a, and in a category or a market that organic or natural, um, the natural sector, I, I believe does rely on a huge amount of integrity. I believe that consumers do know the difference um, when, when people yeah. or product are selling to them in, in that way. And, and when you have this business that, that is held so tightly to a core or a person who leads that, then when it's bought out, obviously that's the interesting and it's probably still, I would say early days, but by all accounts, Robin, and I think that's probably tribute to what you built, it is still totally intact and in, in integrity. And what, um, what I think um, we're seeing, and you, you would probably confirm that, is that this market is growing. It's a growing market in South Africa. This idea of people really now understanding the toxic nature of products and how it impacts their health. I think that the word toxic, and, and I think people knew about organic, but they never really related organic to then the other part of products, which is the toxins, the chemicals. Um, because as you mentioned earlier on, and we don't really have legislation that even deals with that. So yeah. when a consumer buys a product, they actually are not aware, and specifically in the beauty side, whether what is in that product will have any effect on, on their actual health. So, so, so that's something uniquely held, and, and you've now moved on. So how, now you're a little bit out, so you can helicopter it a bit. Where did you see, because you, 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 moved, you moved to investors, but you must have seen the bigger road ahead, and they saw that too in your vision. Mm -hmm. So what is that road? What does yes. that road look like, even if you're not traveling that road? What do you think yes. that road looks like, uh, Robin? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm, I'm still a shareholder and, and still work on that vision with my um, team. I'm just not involved operationally anymore. But um, the way that we coin that, and, and what I've always seen is that um, faithful to nature will become, and in many ways it already is, the green Amazon of Africa. And what we, um, what our vision is, is that if there is ever an, an, an ethical alternative in any product category, that we stop that. And um, it's always been our desire to grow the business through product um, width rather than product depth. Because I want my customer that I love so much out there to be able to get any kind of ethical alternative, whether it's lifestyle, home care, body care, um, from one place. Because obviously there's, there's all sorts of environmental consequences of that too, um, but it's also convenient. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it, that is the vision, that we are that one-stop shop that caters to all one's needs, but built on an ethical platform. And I think on that point, even the packaging, I know that you've, you've put in guidelines for, mm. for, for your, the products that are listed on, on Faithful to Nature, so that you've really tried to follow this ideal of ensuring that even the packaging is not toxic and it's environmentally friendly. And I know you're particularly a champion of a more plastic-free world. So how have you made that possible? Because that's, that's got to be a huge challenge to start changing packaging on people's product. So, um, you know, the, the easiest way to, to influence and have impact there is in the way that we list products. So we do that through our procurement. Um, let's say we've got two suppliers that come to us, um, equally good product, but the one is in better packaging. Um, that product will receive the vetting to actually be listed on our um, website. But what do we do, for instance, as we grow in our own maturity, you know, the, the, the day that we decided, okay, we're bringing in this extra element now of packaging. How do we influence and impact our 13,000 other um, products and, you know, 1,200 suppliers or however many it is? Um, and the way that we decided to do that 
in a way that would also add value to our customers is we created ethical shopping filters. And what that allows the customer to do is to turn off the, you know, to select products based on their ethical filter. So perhaps it's plastic free, um, palm oil free, you know, 100% natural, um, you know, whatever that filter is, and then to only view those products that fit into that category. Now, uh, you know, at um, face value, that seems that the benefit is all for the customer and there's tremendous benefit in that for the customer, but it puts a huge amount of pressure suddenly on our suppliers because it's very clear then, without us lambasting them, it's very clear which products therefore don't fit into those various filters and will affect the sale of their products. And so we were able to, you know, because it's, we, we could send out an, an email and we could work with our suppliers and we do do all of that. We do do all of the soft stuff um, to support them and encourage them. But truthfully, it's only when the customer speaks that the supplier is really going to listen. And by creating those filters on our website, we were giving a voice to our customers to choose and to filter, you know, to apply that ethical filter to an even deeper layer to the products that they wanted to purchase. The technical framework, the e-commerce framework and the technology behind websites is changing all the time, you know, and, you know, in this, in this environment, uh, a person in their home can create a Shopify site now and become a retailer, like I won't say in a day or two, but if you're pretty sharp, you could probably get it up within a week. Um, yeah. Isn't that incredible? And probably again, um, that's been quite a big shift to what happened 14 years ago. Was there, were there any lessons that you also had learned in terms of technology and your technology delivery um, that, that you think have, again, separated you um, and made, made you the success that you have been? So um, those challenges are ongoing. Um, anyone who tries to run an e-commerce business of this size will know it's, it's just a never-ending hole in the bucket, so to speak, in terms of resource that needs to go towards um, providing the ultimate customer experience that we wanted to. Um, we've, we've always stuck to, um, you know, again, being so customer centric, the customer journey and um, the customer experience is at the forefront of any of the modeling that we do, any of the developments that we do priority in our technology. Um, and then keeping things as simple as possible. Um, but just, you know, as an insight, when we started the business um, years ago, we'd been in operation for about three years. And I had a very frustrated customer on the line with me one day telling me that the password we were giving her to use, the, the computer just wasn't accepting it. And I explained to her over and over again that, you know, we, we never gave passwords to our clients. And then eventually I said to her, okay, well, what password do you think it is that we're telling you to use? And she said to me, no, you're saying that my password is case sensitive. <laughs> and then we went into the back end, And I, I mean, there must've been about a hundred different versions of case sensitive as a password, case sensitive 01, case sensitive written in different ways. And, you know, I hope this example just brings to life, you know, how important it is to, to really sit in your customer's position because, um, you know, you, you, can, you can create the most amazing technology in isolation and it can fall completely flat because um, you've really got to understand where it is that your customer is coming from. Mm. Fantastic analogy. So tell me about Robin in our closing art. Tell me about Robin. Where are, you know, you've created this amazing, it's like a child really, who's now growing up. Uh, so what's, what's, your next, what's your next innovation, Robin? Personal innovation. I know you're very interested in, in health and, so, and wellness. Yeah. So the, the driving factor, you know, of the 26 year old um, utopian minded female that started Faithful to Nature was that it was all around impact. Um, you know, when I was working in London, my clients were AstraZeneca, British Gas, Shell, BP, um, and um, I, I needed greater discernment over where I was creating impact. Came to South Africa, started Faithful to Nature, and was very sort of staunch in my environmental activism. activism. But you know, our purpose evolves, all, all of us our purpose evolves. And um, for me, the, the key factor has always been impact. I'm, I'm not so much driven by um, material um, acceleration or title. It, it, it just kind of falls a bit flat on me, but impact really, really drives me. And um, I have realized over the years, um, as I have matured myself, that 
the way that we are going to save this planet is not by saving the planet and putting the planet first. I've, I've realized that um, environmental consciousness is that, it's consciousness. And there is a journey. And one generally starts with recognizing, you know, the start of the journey is, oh, there's more to me. And maybe that um, is influenced by some kind of an intolerance, um, a sensitivity to environmental toxins. But that journey starts with, oh, there's something more than me. So let me start extending my energy beyond myself and recycling because it's also, you know, this planet is collective, it's, it's shared. And as consciousness starts to raise there, vibration starts to raise, we realize, oh, but you know, what I put in is what I get out. So let me start looking at what I'm putting in and the toxic load. And oh, this has given me more energy and, and the greater energy to serve. I then start thinking about the animals and the plastic. And, and so my consciousness grows. And um, with this journey that I've been supporting so many on for so many years, I've reached a point in my own development in terms of the impact that I want to create that um, I no longer believe that if we heal the planet, we heal the man. I now understand that we need to heal the man to heal the planet and it's around consciousness. And I've always had a very active and um, deep yearning for spiritual progression and understanding and self-discovery, um, something that was awakened when I was about 16. And um, right throughout all of this journeying with Faithful to Nature, I was then in my spare time putting all of my energy into my own spiritual development. And I now um, work as an energetic healer um, and I do one-on-one -on -one healings, but even more than that, um, and where the vision is, is going is that I am spending more and more time guiding people in their spiritual journeys. Um, I teach classes, I run initiations, and all of this is through um, the, tr the mystery tradition, which is a very ancient um, tradition that actually used to have its doors closed to the public up until very recently. So it's, um, it's teaching that I'm very honored to be part of. Um, and in fact, just as we went into lockdown, the day, the Thursday that we went into lockdown, I received transfer to a property that I've purchased and I'm opening a wellness center in this area. Um, I've recognized that there's a huge gap in um, space for this kind of work, um, clean space um, for sort of wellness um, and um, space, you know, I'm gonna be renting out space to other practitioners that I've vetted myself as having done good work um, and so, you know, that journey of just, um, yeah, helping others and inspiring others to have greater impact continues. But now it's, it's a little bit more concentrated. Always inspiring to speak to women in business like Robin Smith and people who are very visionary around the health. I hope you enjoyed this segment. Please join me again next week on the business of health. In the meantime, take care, stay well.